All right, it's just on the half past seven mark. Um, for everyone that has so far, uh, you're very, very welcome. Um, my name is Sandra Hayes. I'm a dairy advisor with Chagas in Thurles County, Tipperary, and I'm joined by Dermot Murphy from Germinal. Dermot, or Dermot, you might say hi and introduce yourself to the audience. How are you doing? Um, yeah, my name is Dermot Murphy. I'm with Germinal for the last 10 years. Uh, well, 10 years next February to be exact. Um, area manager covering the predominantly the northeast and west of the country and yeah I'm here tonight to, to speak to you all about soil health and managing soil. Great lovely that's brilliant so before we just get into the, the presentation uh, for anyone that's not uh, familiar with the webinars or with Zoom um, we have a Q&A button that's down the bottom um, of the screen and we'd really really welcome um, myself and Dermot any questions um, the way we're hoping to do the webinars, like the other ones that we'll go through, Dermot will go through his presentation, and uh, we're hoping that you'll integrate with us and interact and put the questions up, and we hope to stop every slide or every couple of slides, depending on the volume of questions, and try and get them answered for you. Um, if not, then we'll definitely finish them off with a Q&A session at the end of the, the webinar. Um, you can put them up anonymously, or you can put up your name on them, there's no problem. And I know at the end of the webinar, there is a small survey that Germinal would like you to uh, fill out. And really what that's for is so that we can uh, get feedback on what you, future topics you'd like us to cover, what you liked, what you disliked, um, and we can only benefit and, and make them better for the next webinar by you giving us our feedback through the, the small survey at the end. So um, yeah, during these um, times, we can't get out, neither myself or Dermot can get out to major events that we're used to host and either separately or together. And um, so the webinar is our next best thing to, to reach an audience. And if you miss any of the part of the webinar, it's going to be recorded. And I think you said, Dermot, it's available from Monday. Right. Right. So anyone that has registered and has to leave or whatever will be able to get their, their recording um, on Monday. So we'll get kickstarted, Dermot. Um, managing Soil Health, I'll leave it to you. Okay, thank you, Sandra. Okay, so for the purposes of tonight's uh, webinar, Sandra, I'm going to assume that the, the large majority of our audience are livestock farmers. However, regardless of whether they're livestock, regardless of whether they're horticulture, regardless of whether they're arable farmers, soils are the backbone of all farming enterprise across the yeah. board. Okay, but as I say, I'm going to assume that the, the vast majority of our audience are livestock farmers and therefore they're probably trying to increase their, their yield, their quality and their utilization. What I mean by increasing their yield, I mean they're aiming to grow more forage. This will allow yeah. them to carry more stock, or it will also um, allow them to build up more stock in terms of uh, their, winter, their winter fodder, okay? Conserve more fodder. Yeah. They're also trying to increase the quality of their, of their grass. So uh, quality is the key driver for all room and production. If you're a dairy guy, for example, and you can increase the quality of grass, it'll allow you to produce more milk. If you're a beef or a sheep guy and you can increase the quality of grass, well, it'll allow you to produce more meat. Yeah. And then finally, they're, tra they're trying to increase their utilization. So they're trying to optimize the proportion of the grazed grass in the diet. And if they cannot graze it, they'll insoil it and they can feed it later. Yeah. As I always say, if um, you don't get to utilize it in a grazing situation and you conserve it, it's like um, an asset in the bank. It's, it's mm -hmm. there on your farm. Yeah, very important. That. As long as I'm around, well, as long as I'm around, I've never seen a bale of silage thrown out yet. No, and uh, in the last number of years with the different weather events and storms and, you know, droughts and stuff like that, um, whether it's grazed or ensiled, it's a very important um, product and reserve to have on your farm. So by tonight's webinar and you going through these slides with us, um, you know, farmers, um, whichever they, they farm horticulturally or with cereals or with livestock that you know it's it's the big plus for them to to gain even a small nugget to improve their, their soil health absolutely it's a finite resource at the end of the day um, yeah. they're not producing any more land so yeah it's it's something uh, our soils are something that we need to uh, we need to treasure we need to nourish and they're not to be exploited exactly exactly all right moving on there dermot okay so our aim is to grow and to utilize more grass so where do we start what is our starting point well, if the pollution is not above the ground, most likely, Sandra, it's below the ground. So we should start from the ground up. And by that, what I mean is we should start with our soil health, okay? Okay. And our soil health can be di divided into three components, physical health, chemical health, and biological health. 
What I mean by the physical health, I'm referring to the soil structure and texture. So okay. Structure, I'm talking about uh, the size and shape of the soil particles. And in terms of the, the texture, I'm talking about the shape and the feel of the soil. Okay. So whether it's a clay soil, whether it's a loamy soil, sandy soil. Okay. In terms of the chemical health, I'm referring to there is what we would call our soil fertility. So that's our, our P and K and our lime status. And okay. you want to know, Sandra, that 90% of the soils tested in this country are suboptimum for either P, H, P or K. Yeah, correct. And finally, when I talk about the biological health of the soil, I'm referring to the, the flora and the fauna. So the micro the microorganisms, your um, soil organic matter, earthworms, etc. Okay. So like what you're saying to me now about the soil that we farm um, on a daily basis, um, if we don't look after it, like we look after our own health, uh, we're not going to be able to solve any problems. So if I had something wrong internally with me, um, the doctor would get a set of blood results or something like that to know what's going on inside, stuff they can't see. So if I needed to find out about my soil, I either dig a hole and look at the soil profile or I get a soil test and find out that way. Absolutely. And if we look after the soil, it'll look after us. It's like any relationship. Yeah. If you look after yourself, Dermot, you'd live longer. Yes, yes, yes. Hopefully that's the plan anyway. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. So in terms of the, the soil structure and the texture, as I say, two good photos here. Yeah, there, there's two good two contrasting photos. So yeah. as, there's a photo on the left hand side where you can see that's a compacted soil. Okay. And a couple of inches down from the from the top, you will see a knife sticking out. And just above that, Sandra, you will see a discolored layer. And this is called, okay. okay? And it's basically, it's a sign of a compacted layer or a pan. And you will okay. notice that there's no roots below that layer. So as I say, there's no roots getting down, getting down through that subsoil. And most likely that soil was compacted either through machinery or through livestock, but it's clearly being compacted and that's the problem. So it's not going to produce, it's not a healthy soil, it's not a fertile soil. Okay, so there's going to be restriction of growth, restriction in the movement of nutrients. Um, nothing can come up and nothing can come down. Exactly, yeah. It's a, essentially like a, 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 a concrete piece across the soil, so yeah. Okay. But okay. not not beyond repair. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. And uh, contrast that to the picture on the right hand side. Uh, okay. There's no discoloration, so it's completely uniform from the top to the bottom. You'll see quite a healthy looking grass crop on top. And also where there's a, a knife sticking out uh, just on the right hand side, a couple of inches down. Yeah. Separating the topsoil from the subsoil. It just illustrates how there's there's roots permeating down through that through that topsoil down into the subsoil. So that's a healthy looking soil. It's a vibrant looking soil. That's what we want. That's what we're striving to to achieve. Yeah. To be fair, the one on the left even looks sick. You know, yeah. it, it look uh, it's, it's, like it's starved. So it yeah. is. Yeah. And most likely, if you try to break up that soil with your hands, it would probably break up in horizontal layers because that's the okay. way. OK, yeah, often seeing pans like that and really um, my advice to any farmer that, you know, wouldn't be sure what's wrong with their field uh, to get the spade out and to dig, um, you know, a soil profile. Even better, I remember having a discussion group and we got a mini digger and we dug a hole and we tracked down the soil profile. And it was really interesting to see all the different layers. Now, there's layers like what you pointed out there on the left hand side and they look like layers, but they're permeable. Yes. This one you're pointing out is, as you say, like a concrete structure in the soil. Absolutely. And that's why the, the, the spade is one of the most important things you can have in a boot of your car. Because, as I say, if you go out to a farm, be, be it a, a tillage guy or be it a, um, a, a grass man, and he's having issues, if, there, if the solution is not above the ground, well, then it's obviously below the ground centre. So the only way okay. to find out what that is, is to dig a hole. So you're 100% correct. OK, great. Okay, you might re remember from your UCD days, Sandra, I, I presume you had a, 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 a Professor Smiley. I he, did, I did. It's not that long ago, but yes, yeah, I did. Only the other day. <laughs> uh, and he used to be talking about soil scoring uh, different soils according to their level of compaction. So these yes. are three different soils that be com being compacted to different levels. Okay, so we have a, a soil on the left-hand side, which isn't, hasn't been compacted at all. So the okay. aggregate 
or the, or the soil particles are quite small, they're quite loose, they're free, so they're not compacted, they're not condensed, and that's exactly what we want. We want it to be easily broken up as soon as we as soon as we dig it up or we dig a soil profile and we take out a, a sample. We want it to say quite okay. easy, free and yeah, easy to break up. Contrast that to the soil in the middle. The, the soil aggregates or the particles are a little bit bigger, they're more condensed, and roots won't work down through these as easily nor, mm. or nutrients nor as water. So it's just a most likely this soil was trampled by livestock at some stage or poached. Okay. And lastly, if we look at the picture on the right hand side, the soil particles are very big, they're very condensed, they're almost concrete like, and roots will not be able to work their way down through this, nor will moisture. And nor earthworms nor anything. It'll 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 just it'll be impermeable, simple as. And most likely, this was caused by something heavier, the likes of. Okay. So you know, nowadays we now have bigger tractors, we now have bigger slurry tankers, bigger silage trailers, and rather than going out with eleven hundred gallons, we're going out with three thousand gallons. Rather than bringing in a quarter of an acre of grass, we're now bringing in an acre of grass. This, unfortunately, is a consequence of that. But it's not beyond remedy. And okay. We'll talk about it in a second, but that's unfortunately the way it is. Okay, so like I was talking to you before, we I'd kind of um, in easy kind of terms to the no compaction one is a bit like your your sponge that has you know form and structure about it, but it's got plenty of air holes, which can, you know the earthworms move through, the nutrients move through, the you know the moisture um, moves through, and as you move from left to right to the trampling and the tractor, unfortunately it's like getting that sponge and filling it up with kind of a liquid that would turn to kind of semi kind of concrete state where uh, nothing's going to allow the nutrients to, to, to flow through. And you could have uh, in one field alone, uh, Dermot, all three of those structures. Different areas, yeah. Field, yeah. You know, you could have an area far away with no compaction whatsoever. You could have an area uh, then maybe we're close to a ring feeder, perhaps where it was being trampled or it was being poached. And then you could have around the gap where you're going in and out with your slurry tankers and your silage trailers. Yeah, that's that's that, that's like the third picture. So absolutely, yeah. it's not beyond. So that. it's very important then, if we go back to the use of your spade, to dig numerous holes in, in you know, in various areas of the field to see to the extent that you have a da damaged field. Correct, get a true picture, absolutely. Yeah, okay. Okay, so just, um, this is just another slide on compaction. And yeah. Um, as, as the weeks and months progress um, and winter moves on, this will probably become an all too frequent picture around the country. And yeah. uh, there's two major issues with this, basically, Santa. Okay. Okay. You have the subsequent grazing, which is going to be severely impacted in terms of yield. So 10, 15% of the yield uh, drop because it's after being severely poached or treaded this grazing. And not just that, another consequence of it is that. If you have a field that's severely poached or it allows uh, weeds and weed grasses to enter that sward. And now, okay. instead of lasting 10 to 12 years, it may only last four to five years because the weeds and the weed grasses are taken over. And unfortunately, yeah. the receipt is earlier than was probably intended. Yeah, yeah, we would see uh, big, big problems with uh, kind of bench grasses, couch grasses, um, kind of buttercups would be one as well and dandelions and like the buttercups and the dandelions like are kind of like plate sized um, and it's amazing how much ground that they can cover particularly in April and May um, in around their flowering period and uh, you know can have a severe impact on on production due to that problem you know that happened over the winter time. And I think it's only when they go to flower, Sandra, if you're anything like me, it's only when they go to flower that you really notice them, as in... Yes, yeah. You don't need to take too much notice until they go to flower. And the next thing you see, it's just a sea of yellow all of a sudden, and you go, God, I really didn't realise how much buttercups or how much dandelions is in that field. Exactly, exactly. But more than likely, they were brought about by... They're either brought about by poor soil fertility or else, yeah, a compacted layer. But just one yeah, other... Just a, yeah, just a question we've been on, on that. Can high intense rainfall cause pans with water tables in certain soils. Can I link them with that photograph there, maybe on the left-hand side? Absolutely, absolutely. And the issue is now, Sandra, that we're, rather than getting a week's rain over a week, we're now getting a week's rain in a couple of hours. And yeah. all this weight, what they call it, like, as in a couple of tons in terms of weight, what they call it, pulling down on the soil, and yet pulling down nutrients and pulling down soil particles. And absolutely, that can create a pan four or six inches below the ground. Yes, that's 100% possible, yes. 
Yeah. The only way to find out that if, for example, you end up with a paddocks like these, particularly if it's dry land. Okay, we all know okay. what wetland is and we all have wetland at home. Yes. If you have dry land and it's holding water, like in these pictures here, well, then okay. something wrong. And the only way to find out exactly what that is, is to dig a hole. But most likely it is compaction. If it's dry, if it's dry land and it's holding water, there's something wrong. Okay. Okay. Back to our digging our hole again. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. 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 Very yeah. Good. A picture of paint the cows in water, Sandra, and I thought this oh, was yes. very, I came across um, in research, in, on research and for tonight's webinar. It's a trial that was done in Germany where they fitted a grain trailer with two different types of tires, basically, and they have a standard a single tire on the right hand side and they have a flotation tire on the left hand side. And they basically measured the comp compaction caused underneath these tires per square inch. And there was a 68% reduction, which is huge, in yeah. the compaction per square inch underneath the flotation tire, as opposed to the standard super single tire. Yeah. And that is why you and I have talked about this before as well, Senator. That yeah. is, you're increasingly seeing modern machinery, so our silage trailers, our fertilizer spreaders, our slurry tankers, now fitted with flotation tires because basically th that will really that will result in less ground uh, pressure and less compaction cost. Yeah, because even like in, in our conversation on the previous slides talking about pans, you can see there on the, the very slim tire used, the yeah. layers that are used in the picture, the contrasting dark and, and light is the, the bars are much, much closer together. They're nearly mm -hmm. into, the, into the one. So there's a number of pans there compared to the flotation tire you can still see the visible layers and the compaction of the day isn't as, as, as strong. Yes, and the tillage farmers will particularly be tuned into this as in uh, there's a lot of um, minimal cultivation techniques now and, and, and that's the idea. It's just that you're trying to reduce the ground pressure uh, caused by machinery. Yeah, like something with tillage beside us here um, at home, I just noticed that the, the tillage farmer when, you know, when the straw is taken off the field, He's just gone in with kind of a machine with blades. I suppose they're about four or five inches long and they're only doing kind of inside the gate and the headlands or anywhere where trailers were parked for a long period of time, you know, and then they go and mint till. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. I was I was passing by a, a, a field that was being sowed the other day with um with winter barley and yeah he was just uh, he was sowing the he was sowing the, the, the body of the main body of the field and he hadn't plowed or he hadn't sowed the headlands yet. And again, the idea of that is that you do the cultivation in the main body of the field and then later, what you call it, you come along and you do the headlands. Because if, yeah. if, you, if you plow the headlands first, you're, you're turning and twisting on that the whole time, you're going to cause it to become more compacted. Yeah, and, and like tillage farmers are, are very good with their, their level of detail. They can see that there's reduced yields. Of the field. You know, they, they can record the tonnage and they can see that the headlands, you know, aren't performing to the, and they're getting the same nutrients as the the main body of the field so it you know it's about it's it's, it's proper order that they are trying to remedy that situation so the whole field yields the same crop same the same would be here for the the grassland farmers yeah uh, when, when you mention remedy um just <laughs> yet yeah, in terms of re, remed, uh, remediation work <laughs> if, you, if you have identified a a pan or a compacted layer standard there's basically two main uh, machinery uh, machinery implements that you can use to remedy that okay depending on how far down your okay there is or your pan is so if your if your compacted layer is zero to ten centimeters well you can use a machine like on the left hand side it's called a slit aerator so that'll go down typically about 10 okay. which is four inches essentially so if your pan is within that depth okay that should solve your problem however if your pan is down deeper if it's down 15 20 25 centimeters you may have to use a subsoiler or a sword lifter. Okay. And um, would, um, would farmers use a plow as well for this? Absolutely. absolutely. Both of these machines will be suitable if, for example, it was receded in the last number of years and it was after just okay. being back or or there was a lot of machinery come back. But if, if it's a field that's targeted to be receded, yes, absolutely, you can plow till and so on. And that will remedy the situation also. Okay. Key thing would be again know where your the, the depth of your of your pan uh, first. And the only way to know that is to dig a hole. So uh, oh, back to digging yeah. a hole. <laughs> yeah. Take home message from this webinar: dig a hole. Yes. yes. <laughs> um, 
and yeah. another another thing I know with those machines, um, because I would have clients that would have used them, and to be fair, contractors are very knowledgeable mm -hmm. on where different machines work in different circumstances. Um, but it's also very very important to remember the time of the year and the weather conditions because I do know that after the the drought in 2018, um, the soil actually self repaired itself. It it cracked and it fracked as we call it naturally due to you know the lack of moisture um, uh, because people noticed um, you know huge volumes um, of dry matter being grown on their their grass wards in the latter end and that was due to you know moisture coming on it but it had naturally cracked open and um, so in using these machines as well you pointed out to me you know to be careful as well because I think you call it smearing that um, yeah, yeah. If, if it's not problem. <clears throat> if it's not drying up when you're using these machines, you will end up smearing the ground and essentially exacerbate the situation, making it worse. Okay. One other tip, uh, perhaps, uh, not, not if you're going to use either of these machines, is if you had access to a mini digger, not, not too many farmers will have access to a mini digger, but if you had access to a mini digger, ideally when you're using these machines, if you could dig a, a, a soil profile or dig a hole essentially again, but rather... Yeah. With a spade. If you had a mini digger, it'll go down deeper. So if, for example, you were using the machine on the right hand side, the subsoil, yep. that goes down deeper than you're more than likely fit to dig with a spade. So if you okay. had a, a loader or something like that, if you were using the lights of a, a subsoil, it would be ideal just to dig a profile and yeah, just to make sure that it's doing exactly what it's meant to do. Perfect. I have two questions. I am linked to this um, slide there, Dermot. Uh, one of them is Are the erasures with a kinked blade? better or worse? I'd say with kink blade, um, yeah, I don't think it's going to make a huge difference whether it's a straight blade or a kink blade. I'd say more than likely, I'd say the weather conditions, again, are going to be more important, as in if it's sufficiently dry, I believe yeah. that a straight blade or a kink blade is good enough, will do the job. Okay. But if, as I say, more important than a machine, it's actually the conditions that the machine is used in, I would say. Okay, and a question then on cover crops in tillage crops uh, using things like the tillage radish, uh, leafy turnip, etc., to break pans, but also bringing back organic matter into soils. Um, yes, we could learn something from this. So that's that's another strategy as well. Um, they're just they're, the tillage farmers are just trying to um, essentially use crops like tillage radish. Yeah, which has a long tap root. It's, it's a little bit like the principle of clover. It has a, just a deep tap root. Uh, and the idea is that they're trying to use that to do the re to remedy the situation instead of using machines. So rather than burning diesel and traveling over ground, they're just using tillage radish uh, to do the job for them. But yeah, because we, we saw that in the webinar um, last month that yeah. um, some of the, the livestock farmers are putting in plantain and chicory. Yeah, yeah, very same principle. Or deep tap root, so it goes down, scavenge nutrients, scavenges your N, P, and K for deep uh, from uh, down deeper in, in in the subsoil, brings that up, makes it available to the other the other plants, and uh, yeah, it just does the job for you. It's it's doing the same thing as either of these machines. And Perfect. also, the advantage of those is you're incorporating, a, a, you're building your 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 soil organic matter, you're providing green manure. So yeah, they are they are definitely worth thinking about if you're Good. a farmer. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, this is, uh, I had a brainwave, Sandra. If you and I could come up with a way of <laughs> bottling these, telling these little guys, we'd be very wealthy people, okay? Okay. Uh, they're, they're affectionately known as the, the biological plow from a soil scientist's point of view, okay? Yeah, they're a man's best friend when you have soils. Yes, particularly arbor guys. Arbor guys go mad for, for earthworms. Yeah. Uh, so I'm not going to get into detail about the different types of earthworms, but there's essentially three different ones. There's uh, okay. worms, there's endogeic worms, and there's anetic worms. And okay. long story short, you want as many as you can in your soil. Yes. If you dig, for example, a foot square in terms of a hole. Okay. Well, if you can target to have 16 to 20 per square foot, that is what they okay. call the population. Okay. So... If I am driving along the road tomorrow and I see somebody ploughing for winter crops and I don't see any birds, Dermot, what uh, does that any seagulls, then there's not too many earthworms. Yeah, yes. so not a good sign. You'll be able to make an observation from over the ditch. You won't need to go into the field at all. Um, yeah, if you don't see birds landing in a field after being ploughed, it's not good because that means there's probably not, not earthworms in it. And one of the best ways we can 
I suppose, promote earthworm activity is by ensuring we have optimum pH, so 6.2, 6.3 for in grass, okay. uh, for an arable, and by ensuring that we have a soil organic matter of somewhere between 3 and 4%. They are the best ways in which we can promote earthworm activity. And okay, so if we didn't have... If, if we didn't have a soil, okay, the pH we can correct, like what we're going along, we're going to talk about the lime. But if we didn't have a soil organic matter of three to 4%, what could farmers do to increase the number of, of worms? The yeah, likes of your farm of manure, your slurry, your mushroom compost, your, your uh, we, we just spoke about it, your tillage radishes, green manure, any form of okay. manure will help to increase your soil organic matter. And what about mob grazing, you know, grazing yeah. like yeah, can be done with you got it basically where you introduce stock and they walk uh, a lot of the grass into the ground. Yes, that will that will definitely help to improve your your soil organic matter. But if you could accompany the mob grazing along with some farm air manure, as I say, or slurry or mushroom cotton husk, it might just okay. be quicker. But definitely grazing uh, as opposed to cutting will increase your, your, your soil organic matter that bit quicker. Because if grazing, you're recycling nutrients, uh, animals are dunging, they're urining, as opposed to cutting. If you're cutting, well, then essentially everything you're cutting, you're removing. So, yes, yes. Would, definitely, uh, would definitely help. Yeah, because I know I was explaining there's a video that I saw, it's a long time ago now, but it um, had a soil profile done and the number of worms in it. And they put farmyard manure on top of the soil. And uh, it was in fast forward mode, but you could see the way the worms climbed up, you know, making holes, aeration holes up through the soil profile and then literally grabbing, coming out and grabbing the farm air manure and bringing it back down and increasing the soil organic matter. And it wasn't until you saw it, you seen what a brilliant job worms actually do. Yeah. They, they make they make the air holes in that sponge effect, you know, all by themselves. So if you've if you've no worms, you've no natural aeration. Right. Uh, the soil, you yes. know. I, I, came, uh, I came across it recently that uh, I think is that to say that earthworms consume two ton uh, per hectare per year of soil and essentially regurgitate it and pass it back out, making healthy soil. Like, yeah. They're just, they're unbelievable. They, they don't get credit for what they do. Um, yeah. And they, they, arables, arable farmers in particular go mad when they, when they see earthworms. Yeah, I, I just remember on a, on a back when I was working in County Leash when the motorway went through and there was a lot of soil, um, topsoil, um, I suppose mass piled um, on, on fields and uh, then was taken away later on and the farmers got their field back um, and it was receded for them, but it just didn't grow grass. And what wasn't taken into account was the weight of the soil on the normal field for so many years. Um, we tried lots of different chemical fertilizers, lots of different machines, like you've mentioned, but the only thing that worked was a real thick layer of farmyard manure over the winter, and it literally turned the fields inside out in those cases. Yeah. So, I'm glad don't underrate the, ma the, the, the massive work that a worm does. Uh, and um, I'm glad you didn't say anything too bad about least my, my, my native county. <laughs> That's all right. Um, just a question there on something we've mentioned, uh, Dermot, to, in using the, the to spread slurry by the splash plate, uh, found a lot of dead worms. Uh, what should we do to stop this? That's a good, uh, that's a very good question. Um, basically, that is putting out too much slurry at one time in one single application. Yeah. You know, yeah. Sometimes guys should put out uh, four or five, six thousand gallons of slurry, particularly if they were growing maize at, at one time. And um, yeah. Just if you come out the next day after, you'll often see, for example, I was spreading slurry not that awful length ago for my uncle and um, I got a block blockage basically and I was getting down and yeah, that lovely job of uh, taking off the pipe and putting in your hand. Clearing and the blockage. Exactly. But as a result, there was a big pool of, of, of slurry in, in one place. And I remember my uncle remarked to me that he came out a couple of days later and essentially, yeah, yeah like all the earthworms that came up through that pool and died and um, so basically it's from putting out too much slurry in one single application so it should be yeah. a, a two and a half three thousand gallons slurry maximum the amount you want to be going with per acre in a single application yeah and the other thing too to, to be mindful in that uh, i would totally agree with you on the amount but um take into account the ground and the weather conditions because if you had you know like what we had there the last couple of days you know a lot of heavy rain in a short period of time 
that saturate the soil. And like today was a good day. So let's say today was a day that you were allowed to spread slurry and you went out. You've got saturated soils and you're putting liquid slurry on the top. Yes. There's nowhere for it to go, you know, so that'll that'll add to the problem as well. It's suffocating, simple, uh, no more than uh, any living organism. Yeah, suffocating, simple as, yeah. Uh, yeah. But the, the, the modern spreaders, the low emission slurry spreaders, they uh, reduce the chance of that happening. But yeah, per, as, as, as that question came in, it was, it was splash paid. So yeah, that would make sense. Grant. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so now hopefully that we've um, we've solved uh, or we've covered off the physical health of the soil and moving on to the chemical health of the soil. Okay. And what we call soil fertility, uh, essentially the pH and the P and K status. As I was saying, 90% of soils, you know, Sandra, are suboptimum. So this is something that we really need to address or remedy yeah. quite quickly or as, uh, as quickly as possible. So we need to put a nutrient management plan in place. And I know we've spoke before, you will look after a derogation farmer, so you're probably very familiar with putting together a nutrient management plan. And yeah, I think going forward, perhaps there's going to be a few more farmers in, uh, there's 7,000 farmers at the moment in, in derogation. And going forward, maybe uh, they're talking about an extra four, an extra 5,000. So yeah. Yeah. Every, to, to be fair, uh, Dermot, every farmer should have a nutrient management plan. Oh, absolutely. It's it's yeah. it's, it's joined up thinking essentially, Sandra, between their soil and their their slurry and their fertilizer. So yeah, we, every single one of us should have a nutrient management plan in place. Yeah. Joins dots essentially. Yes, hundred percent. Okay, so a nutrient management plan can be broken down into five simple steps. Okay, and in okay. the slides, I'll go into all of these five steps in more detail. So if there's any questions or queries, we may cover them off in the next couple of slides. If not, feel free to send them in. Lovely, great. Uh, so we need to have a soil test for the entire farm. So it's like me making a jigsaw. We need to have all the pieces. Um, we should apply lime as required per soil test. We should aim to achieve and, and maintain index tree for P's and K's. We need to use our organic fertilizer as efficiently as possible. It's a resource. Um, and we need to use a compound fertilizer with the correct balance of nutrients. Perfect. Yeah. Five point plan. Yes, yes. Okay, so soil testing. Um, I've mentioned it already. If, if I was going in for an operation tomorrow morning, um, I wouldn't like the doctor to cut me open without <laughs> taking an x-ray first. So it's the same principle, uh, soil test. Without a soil test, you're essentially, you're shooting in the dark. How can you know how much, or to use an analogy of uh, putting diesel in a car, how can you know how much diesel, or, or putting, oil, sorry, oil in a car, I should say. How do you know yeah. how much oil engine if you don't dip it first you need it yeah. you need to know where you're going exactly exactly okay so you should take a, a a soil test every three to five years um you should take one sample per field or every four hectares um 10 centimeters deep um which is four inches and you should take 20 cores per sample so that you get a representative sample perfect yeah you should sample three to six months since the last application. That's a farmyard manure of slurry or of a chemical fertilizer. And lastly, I would say if you're receiving soil sample after plowing, you'd be amazed, Sandra, the amount of times that I went out to a farmer mm -hmm. after receiving in the last year or two and his receipt is, is not performing. And he rings us up and he says, Will you call out and have a, lift, have a look and see? Can you point a finger? Uh, of what's gone wrong and I'd say to him have you got a soil sample and he'd say yeah I have a soil sample there from last year and for example it's index two for P's and K's so okay it's not a, it's not in index three which is ideal but it's, index two, it's not all that bad um, and I'd say to him God, is that from before that's obviously from before you plowed and he'd say yeah well sure then at the end of the day that that sample uh, is irrelevant Sandra because yeah that top four inches or 10 centimeters is now yes. after turned down correct yeah correct. yeah now you have a, a, a yeah. four inches on top where your reseed is after going into and that's probably not as fertile and yeah that's basically where it's gone wrong yeah just on some of your pointers there that you have for the people are listening tonight um so i have clients that at this stage due to you know their, their soil sampling in a number of years and when they leave the tests like for derogation farmers they have to soil sample every four years right that's part of the, the scheme but um Farmers are finding that they're noticing dramatic changes when they leave it for four years. So a lot of them would be soil sampling um, at least half the farm every year or they would wait every two years. 
Um, the benefits of that is that they're noticing and they're um, able to mitigate against changes an awful lot quicker by getting a, a set. Um, and they find you're right there, which are one sample per field. Um, some people say, but should those three or four fields are doing the same thing? They, you know, they, they have cattle on them every year, but you don't know what's underneath. Um, and every field due to soil structure or soil type could be different. Some soils hold on to nutrients an awful lot better than others. So that's why we'd encourage, like yourself, there's a sample per field. Um, yeah. Yeah. And the sampling three to six months after the last nutrient application, the reason why that's important is you could have spread lime, let's say, during the summertime. Um, and if you go, you know, three months after, uh, depending on which type of lime you've spread, that could still be working. So you could get a false reading. Um, false. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So they, they, they would be the reasons. Look, I know it's it's like when you're trying to plan things, um, our soil sampler, I wouldn't like to be sending them out, but when farmers ask me when's the best time to soil sample, I say Christmas week. Um, now we can't do them all in the one week, it's not possible, but in around that time, because it's the most dormant time, you haven't any slurry, you haven't any farm air manure, you've definitely no chemical fertilizer in the system, so, you know. It is an ideal time. I know it is. Just, my uncle at home, he's a dairy farmer, and he always, at the end of January, so just a month later than, 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 than you suggested, Sandra, and yet it's just right before, just right before he goes out with, let's say, his first round of fertilizer. And the idea of, leave, he tries to leave it as long as possible in order yes. to get the most accurate soil sample. So yes, yeah. the longer you can leave it since your last nutrient application, well, the more accurate it is. Yeah, it, exactly. I'll just check here, Dermot, before we just move on, just uh, for any questions. Um, should you even be reseeding if you haven't got a soil analysis? Great question. And uh, reality is, Andrew, I'm the journal 10 years of my job is to sell seed. I am, uh, as I say, um, <laughs> under road selling seed. But we would say, in fairness, we would say that if a farmer does not have a, an accurate soil test, no, he shouldn't recede. No. Um, well, I suppose allow me to go back a bit he, he should number one get a soil test right so yeah. at least he knows what his soil fertility is but what he should do sandra is remedy his soil fertility so if it's 100 yeah okay he should do that before he recedes because reality is if he does not remedy that he will not realize the potential of the recede so he's yeah. going to bad opinion of me and he's going to have a bad opinion of the grass shock and seeds and shock and seeds exactly i'll get to blame or the contractor will get to blame but um <laughs> i know but yes he they should number one they should take the soil test and they should act on the soil test before they recede in order and i'd say reality is as well that there's some fields out there that don't need receding as in if they if the if the field in question was addressed in terms of its fertility so it's ph and it's p and k it, it'll grow sufficient it'll grow uh, more grass so it may not even require receding okay good question yeah i know a good question a very good question that's coming in now and i'll i'll answer it and then you can add your top and it. but the question is should the farmer soil sample or should the contractor do it right so in in my particular case i don't actually have a soil core because if i did i'd never get it back right <laughs> So I won't do this, the soil sampling, right? Dermot, I know you're going to give us advice on how to do it now in a minute. But we have um, the person that does the, 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 the so-called contractor in our case is someone that has been soil sampling for a very, very long time and uh, is very good at it, um, follows the technique that Dermot's going to show you and takes immaculate records of where each sample was taken down to the you know, the name of the field that the farmer calls it so that we can trace it back, right? And that information to me as an advisor when I'm doing up the nutrient management plan is absolutely in invaluable. Now, I'm not saying that a farmer can't do that as well. They can both do it equally well. But if you have somebody that is, you know, after spending a long time doing soil samples, I would leave it to the contractor. From, from my point of view, in the, in the process, the way it's done and it's it's very organized um, and I suppose regimental. And we're, we, we like that because, you know, it's an investment that you're making and we want to make sure that you get financial reward at that. There's no point in the sample being taken and it goes down to the wrong field. You know, it's not even worth taking it. So I don't know what you think, Dermot, but um, 
either could do it, but it, my preference would be the contractor. I wouldn't, I wouldn't mind whether it was the farmer that did it or the contractor did it. Once the person that did it was familiar with the land, as in knew where to, there's places that, and we'll cover it in the next, the next slide, Sandra, there's places yeah. that should be avoided, as in once they wouldn't go into, for example, we, we, we talked about it already, artificial highs, as in around where it, there was a, a ring feeder or mm. a, by the hedges and ditches. Once the sample they take was, was a relevant sample, they took it to the correct depth, to follow the guidelines. So once it was a true sample, um, I wouldn't have a major preference whether it's the yeah. contractor or whether it's the farmer. Someone that knows the land more than anything is what I'd say. So whoever knows the land the best, be that the contractor in it every year, uh, spreading yeah. the soil, putting the silage, whoever knows that land inside out, that's the person that should take the soil sample. Perfect. Okay. Okay. But just a, a couple of do's and don'ts in terms of uh, soil testing or soil sampling. So just from a cost point of view, it's roughly 25 euros per sample. So if you're doing four hectares every five years, it equates to one euro 25 per hectare per year, <clears throat> which is essentially less than uh, the price of one kg of P. So it's certainly not that expensive. No, uh, good investment. Yeah. Uh, and as I say, a representative sample. Um, so whether it's a farmer, whether it's the contractor, they need to take a, they need to, in terms of the pattern, they need to go in a W or it looks like an M in this case, upside down. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, to take at least 20 cores per sample, as I say, to get a represent a true representation. They need to avoid unusual areas. So as I say, around the gaps going into field, around where there was a ring feeder, around where years ago, I, I just know on my uncle's farm, he used it. You can't obviously do it now, but the dung is all stored now inside, inside in the yard. But years ago, it used to be dumped out in the field. So you certainly wouldn't yes. want to yeah. a sample underneath where dung used to be dumped for years. Um, around hedges and ditches, because they mightn't be getting the same fertilizers out in the middle of the field. So just that's the idea of walking an M or, or, or walking a W. It's to get a true sample. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. You should, as I say, we covered it already. We should wait three to six months after the fertilizer or the slurry has been put out. And in the case of lime, we should wait two years after. Yeah. Yeah. Because I know from when the lime is spread, um, you can get a kind of an instant response from the, the kind of, as I call it, the powder, the dust yeah. lime that you know, gets in, but there's also small little granules or nuggets and they break down over time. And, you know, it could be anything, you know, six to nine months to even longer for that process of neutralization of the soil to take place. So that's why you wouldn't yeah. be taking one quickly. Exactly. And you should repeat the soil sample uh, uh, to monitor changes. Uh, like what you said, Sandra, every yeah. two years, every three years, uh, be it four years, whatever the case may be, but you should re uh, repeat it and repeat it at the same time. So if you do it, uh, as yeah. you say, in the month of December, well then in two yeah. time or three years time, you need to do it in the month of December again, just to make sure it's relevant because there's no Perfect. point if you were to do it in the month of December and then in two or three years time, you did it two to three months earlier, again, you could get an artificial high. So just make sure yeah. that you're repeating it at the same time each time. Perfect. Just uh, an, another benefit, um, if you had a, an index of P, if not realizing your poor indices, well, that's limiting your yield or that's, um, yeah, it's essentially, it's, uh, it's reducing your, your yield. So if, for example, you had an index one soil versus an index three soil for P, well, that can be at a different center of 1.5 tons of hectare in terms of dry matter, okay? As in, <clears throat> you're, you're limited by 1.5 tons by being at index one as opposed to index three. And yeah. just for if meal was 260, 270 euros a ton, you could be talking about 400 euros a hectare here that you're losing, um, yeah. or 400 euros a hectare of a saving that you would be making if you were in the tree, as I say, you could save yourself that or grow that extra forage. So it's, it's, it's definitely worth, it's definitely one of the most cost effective things you can do is to take a soil sample. Yeah, that's equivalent. That amount of tonnage of dry matter is equivalent to six to seven, uh, well, depending on the size of the bales, but six anyway, round bales of silage. Yeah, as but like one, they say that there's a there's um for every extra ton of grass that you can utilize, it's 180 euros. Just from a dairy scenario, apologies now. Um, from a dairy scenario, it's 180 euros of, of a difference to the net profit. So if you could grow an extra 1.5 ton, that's what 250, 260 euros per hectare extra net profit from realizing the potential. Yeah, because like you you've outlined there, there's one and a half ton from getting the index one to index three for the phosphorus. There's yeah. also another ton available for increasing the, the, the pH 
Um, so that's two and a half ton. And this perspective, if you had a K potash deficiency as well, of another ton. So that could be up to three and a half ton extra. Yeah. You know, if you're feeding a cow, a dairy cow, I know a ton and a half a meal and no silage, you'd be able to support her with that extra grass growth. But this is the difference, Sandra, between renting renting land, possibly having to rent land down the road and, possibly, and not having to rent the land, as in, yeah. but only achieve your potential inside your farm gate. Well, then you can look at renting land, but until you realize your potential of your land inside the farm gate, as I say. Yeah, and you've one good um, slide there just on the sampling depth, depth, Dermot. Yeah, it's just particularly relevant from a pea point of view because pea is immobile, doesn't travel that, uh, that well down through the soil. So the majority of your pea is in your top couple of inches in the soil. So that's yeah. why it's very important to take an accurate soil, soil sample. So your soil core, for it to go down 10 centimeters, which is four inches, if, for example, you take a soil core and it goes down 15 centimetres or 20 centimetres, well then, as I say, you're not getting a true reading. Yeah, there's actually a comment um, on, on that um, from Adrian. He suggests that land, um, yeah, the farmer should not do their own soil testing because the result is used to justify nutrient applications of cross compliance. So the independent person physically doing the soil sample is important. 100% agree with that. Yeah. Um, he also suggests that land to be reseeded should have its lime uh, required applied two years in advance of the reseeding. You mentioned that before, Dermot, to correct, sorry, to correct um, the soil fertility before you actually go to reseed. Yes, because uh, we've come across farmers, uh, Sandra, that have told us they've corrected their soil fertility, as I say, their pH, their P and K, and all of a sudden, well, I follow because all of a sudden they don't need to recede <laughs> they've, re they've realized the potential of their own ground and yeah as i say so i couldn't agree with that farmer more the soil fertility yeah. needs to be corrected first before they recede and if they correct the soil fertility and they still want to grow more grass well absolutely then they should look at receding okay it's a good question here um, and it's kind of linked to what we've been talking about if you spread lime this year and you need to do a soil test this year what effects does this have on the results well, I'd say you're going to get an artificial high, as I say, you need to wait two years after your, yeah. your last lime application before you soil test for lime. You will still get an accurate result in terms of P and K if yeah. you're three to six months, but you won't get an accurate result for lime. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I get asked that question quite a lot um, as well, um, you know, with, with farmers, because it, as I say, it depends if you've spread the granulated lime you know that you can buy in the co-op and yes. uh, that has a shorter lifespan right. uh, it, it would just last the grace as i would call it it lasts the grazing season whereas if you've gone and got um i suppose from killock quarry in just out the road from yourselves um the dusty particles of that start working instantly you know yeah. to 40 to 50 percent of that works instantly but then you've got 50 percent in kind of little granules and they, you know, wear down over the process of, you know, the next six to nine to a full year. And the lime is doing that process of, of you know, re, recalibrating, recorrecting itself. So if you side sample a year into lime, you, you will get an artificial read in your right, Dermot. I have a boss, Sandra, that you're familiar with, Dermot Campion, who calls the, the um, mm -hmm. granulated lime, he calls it a fire brigade. <laughs> it's instantaneous. Yeah. yeah. We don't want to call it the fire brigade. Brigade. We want a long term solution. Exactly, cost effective solution. Yeah. Here. Right, we want to move on. I think we have all the questions for them, right? Okay, perfect. Yeah. Um, okay, so moving on to soil pH and liming. Um, my boss uh, calls the lime, he says it's the forgotten fertilizer. He says um, we don't realize the, the true value of it. If, uh, perhaps if it was 250 euros a ton as opposed to 25 euro, we may realize it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, so we need to uh, apply lime as per soil test in order to increase our pH up to the target for the crop. So be it a tillage crop, be it a grass crop, maize crop, whatever. Um, okay. A pH of 6.3 for grassland, 6.2 in the high of the area. Uh, Sandra, you know, around here, around the Turles area. Um, yeah, yes. 6.5 for cereals. Okay. okay. It's the most limiting nutrient on Irish farms. As I say, I don't think we realize the, the value of it. 
um, as the, the efficiency of all other nutrients. So our N, our P and K, our, our, our coppers, our cobalt, everything is depending on the lime. If the lime is not right, well, you will never get the most out of any other nutrient that you spread. Okay. Okay, um, perfect. Yeah. Another piece of advice on it is a little and often approach. So less than three ton in one single application and repeat after two years. So if someone was yeah. getting a, a um, let's say a recommendation of five ton, they should go with two ton, two, two or two and a half ton in one single application and then come back then two years later and go with the additional two and a half ton. Okay. Okay. I'm going to preempt um, a couple of questions on the, on the high molybdenum. So, um, Yes, you're right. There, there would be certain areas um, linked with a map um, that was done in Ireland of high molybdenum areas. Um, but we find um, that certain farms that think they're high molybdenum aren't. And the reason how they or how they find out conclusively is they take a grass sample and the grass sample is taken from the what, what the animals are grazing for a period of 20, 21 days. Um, each sample is frozen, then the whole thing's mixed up sent off for analysis and we would also encourage farmers to send off their silage for analysis and that will definitively tell them um whether they're high molybdenum because a lot of people that are you know could be watching this that are saying oh sure i can't i can't spread lime because i'm in high molybdenum you can but you need to do in conjunction with someone like dermot someone like myself and you need to involve your vet as well because you might have to give extra minerals and oh, uh, livestock yeah so it can be done because um, it, it, it can lock up minerals, as you said before. So it's a, it's a balanced um, approach done in conjunction with people that, that know how to do it, as I say, yourself, myself, and the vets. We'd, we'd, I'd always in, include them as well because they're, they would have blood sample results um, you know, with the, the mineral analysis of that uh, you know, on the livestock. So it's very important to have a whole farm approach on, on dealing with that if you're worried. Yeah, just two, two further points as well, Sandra, on lime. Like back in 1983, there was a grant for lime at that time and there was two yeah. tons, I think I read, annually spread in 1983. Yeah. Um, that was, as I say, that, there was a grant going and back at that time, there was a lime kill in every town's land, in every parish. <laughs> you didn't have to travel in no distance. Um, yeah. In 2006, I think it, was, it went down as far as six or 700 tons. And now I think in 2019, it was back up at 1.1, 1.2 million tons, but still if far, if far, it's still falling well short of the 2 million tons that was put out back then. And like, we're now taking out a lot more, we're now growing a lot, a lot, a lot um, yeah. crops of cereals, of grass or whatever. So we're taking a lot more out of the soil than we were back in 1983. And like our fathers and our grandfathers, if they, if they were doing a bit of receding, if they were sowing a bit of barley, no matter what they were doing back then, they went with a, a couple of ton of lime and a bit of 10, 10, 20. And you know what? There was methods and madness. They knew what they were doing. Yeah, I hate to, I hate to see it. As I said, there's, there's more tonnage spread this year. And it's probably linked with the compulsion part of the derogation. Derogation, absolutely. Farmers now um, have to have the lime uh, from their soil test that they take to have in the derogation now spread on the land. And it's, 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 it's a little bit sad, I suppose, from my point of view, that it has to be a scheme that makes people spread something. As you say, if you took a soil sample and you didn't do anything else, if you just spread the lime, you'd reap huge benefits. Um, yes. It's one thing from this webinar, it's to definitely correct your, your soil pH because you could have naturally occurring P and K, particularly the P in your soils, um, that's there already. And you go and, um, spread your lime and you can actually release that and um, it's like all tied up like in cogs and you you spread the lime and it'll it'll break open and that naturally occurring pea is then available for the plant to grow so it's really a no-brainer um not to not to to work on the ph before you do anything else it's the same applies for nitrogen center i couldn't agree with you more i think it's 50 to 70 kgs of, of soil organic uh, nitrogen can be released from increasing your ph from 5.5 to 6.3 so this is essentially free nitrogen free p as you said that were yeah. that we that can be unlocked by simply going out with a couple of tons of lime so it's a no-brainer yeah it's cheap as well it's it's like um, I think what you and I talked beforehand was about 23 euros, 24 euros in this area per ton to get spread. Like I think yeah, if yeah. you on 
uh, for every euro invested in lime, I think there's a seven euro return in terms of additional, in terms of uh, what you get back. Yeah. So additional production. You wouldn't get you wouldn't get that in the bookies. No, it's true. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, so just um, my last slide on, on soil pH and liming. Um, it just it, it, it illustrates what we're just after saying. It's a priority. It, it, it should be a priority. It, it, it's the it's the most limiting nutrient on Irish farms. It's the it's the first thing we need to get right. The optimum pH for grassland is to say a six point two, six point three. The efficiency of all other nutrients, so our N, our P's, our K's, everything is dependent on the lime. Lime is the is the first thing you need to get right. Yeah. And earlier, when we were speaking about the earthworms, the soil biological activity, you will increase this. You will increase the soil biological activity uh, by addressing your lime. That'll that'll uh, result in more P and more N organic uh, organic P and N being released. It'll promote uh, microorganisms. It'll promote our farm activity. It's just, it's a must. It's an absolute must. Yeah. So if I was a farmer, and I'm, I'm looking at that slide now, and we can see where the ring is on the blue, where is the phosphorus. Yes. So you, if you had a soil results for a field that showed just a little above five, yes. and the man or the farmer the, or the woman put a bag of 18, 6, 12 into the spreader and went out and spread on that field with a low pH, I would be turning around and tell him instead of spreading 18.6.12, he spread 9.3.6. How would he feel, Dermot? Well, if you really wanted to put him in a bad mood, you can tell him that he, he made <laughs> 9.3.6, but he paid for 18.6.12. But yes. you're 100% right, Tennant. That, that like, you're just, you're, you're not getting the true value or the, you're not getting the true value out of your, your fertilizer, out of your slurry, out of anything. You can control anything yeah. that field. And you will not realize the value of it unless your line is corrected. Yeah, perfect. And as Another say, it's for it today. Yes, exactly. Yeah. So dig yeah. a, dig a hole and spread line. your line. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just check the I'll just check the questions there while we're well before we move on. Um, okay. Um, okay. Good question. How much does an application raise pH, Dermot? It all depends on the soil, the different soils like sandy soils compared to clay soils compared to loamy soils. It'll raise the pH different. So okay. the best thing you could do is you go with, you follow your, your recommendation. So if you get your soil test and your recommendation is to put out two ton or your recommendation is to put out five ton, follow your recommendation and do what you said, Sandra. Come back two years later and soil test. Okay. Yeah. The only way to know how quick there's no there's no definite answer or no defined answer to that question. It depends on your soil. It also depends on stocking rate. Depends on 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 rainfall because I think I read recently that uh, is it in this country what they call it? I think is it half a ton per acre per year is what is what's used in the soil. Now that's on average. Yes. But like, it'll be influenced yeah. by your stocking rate. It'll be influenced by your production system, as in if you if it's under grazing, if it's under silage. So the best thing to do is follow your recommendation as per soil test and come back two years later and soil test again. And that's yeah, okay. that's the way you'll have of finding out. It's trial and error. Perfect. And this is um, a farmer asking or an, an anonymous person asking a question, but I think they've really answered it themselves. If we sort out our soils and use our slurry co correctly from samples, will we be able to reduce our fertilizer bill? Yes. A shadow of a doubt. Andrew. Yes, 100%. Yeah. Out of a doubt. Yeah. It's coming. I'll, I'll speak about that in a little bit more detail as we yeah. go on. But it's a train that's coming down the track. We're not going to be allowed to stay putting out the same amount of nitrogen than we are. Like, as in, I think by 2030, we have to reduce our nitrogen by 20%. So, like, it's inevitable. Yeah. But it can be done. It's not beyond the possibilities yeah. at all. We just need to realize the potential of your farmer manure, of our slurries. Of, of, of the of the fertilizer that we are putting out we just need to realize its potential and as i say the only the, the primarily way to do that is to correct your line i'm sorry yeah. I'm repeating myself but that's really <laughs> yeah no and i know i know myself i, I know both our in chagas our research stations are doing work on that um you know and they're accounting for it you know they're you know they're writing it down and letting us know but we haven't got the full picture yet and i know some of my clients as well this year have made a concerted effort to reduce their chemical use of fertilizer and using more um, of their slurry, but they're using it via the dribble bar or the trail and shoe. And 
And we haven't got concrete results yet, but it's looking like they're growing the same amount of grass as they did in previous years, you know, so. In that vein, Sandra, I was speaking to a farmer the other day that was having, he had three paddocks, okay, that were all received with the same grass, okay, the same grass, mm -hmm. okay, and there was one paddock that the cows were struggling to graze, struggling to graze, they would not get, achieve the, 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 um, the target the individuals, yeah. yeah. He was wondering what was going wrong and he got an in-depth in soil analysis and it turned out that it was essentially right now this was almost blue what they call it with, with nitrogen but it was just after being peppered with nitrogen and it was rank and it was too too high in nitrogen and it soured the grass and he ended up skipping i think for was it he's telling me two to three rounds he ended up skipping the nitrogen okay and didn't see oh no okay that can't be done on a long-term basis but yeah didn't see any any um negative consequences in those two or three rounds by skipping the nitrogen so yeah like it, it definitely can be done we can reduce our nitrogen and we're going to have to do it yeah like it might be applicable to every field but there might be a percentage of fields that it will be applicable to yeah but it, it, it's a question. Say, you don't tar the whole farm with the one brush you, you, where your soil samples come in the more you take the more knowledge you gain on the farm absolutely absolutely and i just think that there's something psychological in it isn't are we brave enough to, to pull back from going with the 30 units uh, blanket spread every grazing? And are we brave enough to try going with maybe 10, maybe 15, maybe 20 units and, and, and seeing is it possible? But I think or we think that if they do try it, they'll see that it is quite possible to produce the same amount of grass with, with, with less nitrogen. Oh, yeah. Like I have a, I have a lot of clients this year, um, you know, the drip feeding, they if they were on a 20 day round, they might go with 18 units. If they were on, you know, some of them got down to 14 days. They were going with barely 10 units, like really, really small amounts, you know, and an often approach through the grass. Yeah. You know, yeah. So it can be it can be done. Absolutely. So what okay. okay. On there, Dermot. I think we've all the questions answered on that one. Okay. So just moving on to soil fertility levels. Okay. So the aim of P and K and nutrient advice is to achieve and not only achieve, but to maintain optimum soil fertility. Okay. Okay. What a soil test does, Sandra, essentially, is it measures the plant available P and K in the soil, okay? And it measures it or benchmarks it on an index system, okay? So you, if you have a, a soil that's index one, it means that the plant available P and K is very low. In contrast, if you have a soil in index four, it means the plant available P and K is very high, okay? Okay. And the optimum from either a grass point of view or a fertility point of view is index three. That is seen as optimum. That's when the, 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 the soil, the soil P and K is enough to meet the needs of the crop. Okay, right. But the yeah. only thing also to remember is that index three, if you, if you manage to achieve this, uh, or if and when you manage to achieve this, this optimum index, it's that the, the advice at that stage is to replace all takes. So you need, i.e. you need to put in what you take out. Okay. Yeah. So, so your stocking, your stocking rate or your or your system is going to dictate how much you need to put in. For example, if you have a guy stocked at two livestock units to the acre, uh, compared to a guy that uh, when he's on his grazing platform is stocked at three and a half or four uh, livestock units to the acre, just on the grazing, especially when silage is, is it hasn't been taken out. Well, then as I say, he's going to be taken off a lot more than the guy with two livestock units. Yes. Yeah. Um, Guy that's zero grazing, for example, or a guy that's uh, having a tree quit silage system, well, then every time they go into the field, they're taken off, they're taken off, they're taken off. They need to remember to put back in what to take off. It's called the maintenance. Yeah. Yeah. And everybody's, because um, in case people are asking, you know, the, the physical amounts, every, due to what you said there with the stocking rate, everybody's will be different. And we'll go through um, some of that later on. But um, one plan, like if your neighbor's soil plan, even though you think your land is the same and I have the same stock rate, it's not necessarily going to be the same. You need a tailored nutrient management plan with results from your soil tests for, you know, each one is individual. Yeah, a bespoke program for you. Very, very, very much bespoke. Because um, I know we were looking this up ourselves there um, this afternoon. Like you, you talk about like someone say, well, I'm, I don't have any livestock. Um, I just make silage and sell it, right? So really you're selling nutrients as well as selling the silage. You're actually selling nutrients off your farm because what is it? One ton of silage dry matter 
is three to four kgs of, pay, uh, of phosphorus and up to yeah. 25 kgs of potash. Yeah. So you're, 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 you're losing huge amount of nutrients if they're not, as you say, replaced. Well, I spoke to two farmers, I remember this spring, uh, Sandra, that were after going down the road of zero grazing, okay? Um, mm -hmm. One of them was zero grazing at the shoulders of the year and one of them was zero grazing throughout the whole year, but that's besides the point. But there were two farmers that okay. were down the road of zero grazing and they said they couldn't get over how quickly the P's and K's were dropped in the land that was being zero grazed. But I, yeah. I, I, he said he was going back with, with, uh, with fertilizer every time, uh, with bag fertilizer every time. Yeah. But as I say, if it was being, there's a huge contrast, Sandra, between being zero grazed and being grazed because yeah. it, obviously yeah. you're grazing with livestock. Well, again, you're recycling the nutrients, you're returning the nutrients to the, to the ground. So uh, what goes in is essentially a part of it is coming back out. But well, if you're zero yeah. or you're cutting silage, everything is going into the trailer or into the wagon and it's going out the gate. So you just, yeah. the input needs to be equal to output. And I think people, people are amazed how quickly in silage ground or zero graze ground that their P's and K's can be dropped. Yeah, and the other thing to consider, um, I suppose a former member of staff and a member of staff that's coming back to it, Stan Lawler. Stan, I remember at one presentation to me, um, said we st have to start putting a financial value on getting the slurry like to that zero graze land. Like the reason he's zero grazing it is because he can't get cows to graze it. Yeah. So we have to start putting the value on getting that slurry back to out blocks or you know, land that cattle or cows can't graze. It, you know, it, it's invaluable. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. All right, uh, you want to move on there, Dermot, yeah. Just another question, and um, it's probably a question that will come in. So we're we're trying to preempt it. It's one question yeah. I would ask that any uh, any farm walk or farm talk that we do is how do I build my soil fertility in terms of building my P and K yeah. and or how do I go about it? So just um in terms of if you're trying to build your P, uh, the requirement is a uh, ten to thirty kgs uh, of P per hectare per year for each index. So if you're trying to bring it from index okay. one index two to three so that's two to three yeah that's equivalent to a quarter to a half a bag of an acre of a 16 percent p fertilizer super p yeah and similarly for k it's 15 to 30 kgs per hectare per year for each index and that's equivalent to a quarter to half a bag of 50 percent k fertilizer or compound okay what is so the question yeah the question you're going to be asked then dermot um does one size fit all? Will that fix every single index one field that I have on the farm? It's the very same as, as the question about for, as about, about lime a few minutes ago. It will depend okay. on your stocking rate. It will depend on your, because your stocking rate will dictate your offtake. And it'll also depend on the type of soil you have, be it a sandy soil, it's going to take longer to build your P's and K's versus a clay soil that will retain your, your P's and K's that will be better, or a PD yeah. soil. And they, they tend not to hold on to P's and K's. So it all depends on your soil. It all depends on your stocking system. It all depends on yeah, your production system. Again, whether it's a silage field, whether it's a grazing field, whether it's a tillage field. So it's there's no such thing as one size fits all. I'd say it's um, okay. the best advice I could give someone with P and K is a little and often approach throughout the main great growing season is the best time to go with either R and soil. Yeah. Like you said, Sandra, every two to three years, and monitor, do it at the same time every two to three years, and that way you'll you'll be able to monitor. Yeah, yeah, I know that um, when we do up plans and that, um, we'd always say the P, the the, the phosphorus, um, works well as a is a first half player, right? If you have a match, your, your phosphorus is the man to put out first, um, April onwards, and then the potash is your second half player. So particularly at this time of year, I would have a lot of farmers ringing me to know where do I need to apply the potash. So, you know, um, index two to three size would be, you know, a small because muret of potash is zero, zero, 050. So it's quite a lot of potash in one go. So yeah. an index one would get the, you know, the, the quarters to a full bag and then the two to threes would get the, the half bag. Um, and to apply it, you know, bar um, the wet weather, um, but I'd be looking at the forecast, looking at the ground, conditions and murata potash can go out at this time of the year and you're giving it a huge window then till you start grazing in february march period 
for it to work. And like if you're taking a lot of bales off, um, you know, certain blocks, it's definitely one um, that, that needs to be remedied. And for some farmers with some soil types, they can build quickly and build slowly. Um, you know, I, I could have similar farms stock the same, but the soil type is different. So they could apply the same and they won't get the same results. So as I say, each farm is individual. It's very important to follow um, your maps and your guidance from, from your plan and um, what needs to go where and when. Yeah, I'd see particularly in sandy soils to say sandy soils, you, you should if you're going with if you're going with K, um, you shouldn't go with it in the autumn because it can be easily leached, as you say, or, or, or peaty soils as well, but you gotta just be yeah. careful going with it in, in the autumn because they don't they don't tend to retain nutrients. So yes, yeah, so just no. be conscious if you're in a sandy soil or if you're in a peaty soil. But absolutely exactly. or if uh, yeah. any other soils, yeah, you can go with it this time. Perfect. Okay. okay. Um, so moving on to uh, managing organic manures, um, slurry, it's the most, and typically what I'm talking about when I say organic manures is slurry, number one, and farmyard manure, number two. But slurry, it's the most commonly used organic manure in Ireland. It's the most valuable source of organic N, P, and K. Um, uh, however, the only issue with slurry is that there's huge variability in the dry matter and the nutrient content. It can be as much yeah. of a all of a difference in terms of the dry matter and the nutrient content. And the dry matter, just one thing to, to, to bear in mind with, with slurry is the dry matter is the best indicator. It's not, it's not an absolute, but it's the best indicator yeah. of the nutrient content of your slurry. So your N, P and K. So what you're saying is Dermot, the higher the dry matter, the higher the N, P and K. Correct. And one of the, the two greatest variables affecting the dry matter content of your slurry is number one, the amount of water getting rainwater getting into your tank. And number two, yeah. uh, in a dairy scenario, the amount of dairy washings getting into your tank. They're the two yeah. biggest influencers of the dry matter of your slurry. Yeah. They say in Ireland on average, uh, just 7% is the dry matter of, of slurry, and it's 6538 in terms of the MP content of 1,000 gallons. So if we were to be able to put a machine or a factory on each farm and put the slurry in one end and put the bag fertilizer out the other end, that's what they'd get if they had 7 DM. On average, but I would say the, the one thing um, that will be completely influenced by your production system. For example, <laughs> a dairy guy that uh, has a lot of dairy washings getting into his parlor and therefore the, the dry matter is only three and a half percent, for example, as opposed to seven percent, right? Well, therefore, essentially, yeah. P and K is only half. Contrast that, you could have an intensive beef guy who's finishing bulls, for example, with very little rainwater getting into his tanks and he's feeding meal, ad lib, what do you got it? And therefore, his N, P and K content will be completely different. So what goes in yeah. one end comes out the other end. Yeah, and you want that to go back to your soil. So it's a very valuable, valuable component yeah. of the system. Yes, yeah. absolutely. We would see um, like the two examples you showed there. If you had a particular slatted shed on your farm and it had 100 bullocks in it, and then you'd another tank that had 100 dairy cows and the dairy washings were going in, and those sheds were exclusively for the bullocks and exclusively for the cows. If you, as you said there, agitated your slurry and sent two samples, uh, separate samples down to the lab, you can be guaranteed, give or take, a very minor change that, that and you don't change from bullocks and the dairy cows, but that's what's going to be in your tanks every year. So you can, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you'll know what you're spreading. And then it'd be very important then that if you did have fields that were low in P and K, you could target the, the tank of slurry from the bullocks to that land and you could put the dairy, you know, the lower uh, dry matter one onto other fields that only needed maintenance. Absolutely. Slurry, slurry as a general rule is best suited to silage ground. It, now, it, silage ground is not accessible, it's not accessible, but as a general rule, slurry tends to be high in K and therefore, as we alluded to already, silage ground tends to be low in K. So slurry is a very good fertilizer or manure to put on your, your, your silage ground as opposed to your grazing ground. Yeah, 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 definitely. You know, um, sample after agitation, just the last bullet point, sample after agitation, as we've, you've, you've spoken about, and send off for laboratory analysis. The only issue with this, Andra, is that the ideal time to sample it, as I say, is after agitation. 
But when do you typically agitate your slurry? You agitate it on the day you're about to spread it, okay? So you okay. can't take a soil sample, send it off to the lab and get a, get a result straight away. So one of the best unfarm tools that you can use is a, it, an apparatus called a slurry hydrometer. And a okay. base does is it gives you an estimation of the dry matter. And we said it already that yeah. the dry matter is the greatest indicator of the nutrient content of the slurry. So okay. for example, if that tells you that your slurry is three and a half percent dry matter versus seven percent dry matter, well then now if you're going with three thousand gallons of slurry, and I, I was doing the maths on this before, and I think to say three thousand gallons of slurry at seven percent dry matter, I think it works out with 16 units of P, and I think it's 114 units of K. However, if you're going with a slurry that's only three and a half or sorry, only three and a half percent dry matter, well essentially you're only going with half the P and half the K. So therefore you're it's a you're going to be grossly underestimating or overestimating the amount of P and K that you're putting out, and therefore that's going to affect your yields. Okay, okay. Dermot, we better move it on. I'm not a very good um, timekeeper today. Oh. We're, um, we're, gone, we're, got, we're, we're so involved, we've gone by our time, but I know you have a couple of important slides, so we, we might move on to those. Um, um, as I say, if you like, Sandra, I'll skip through this one, as it, it's just reinforcing what we were saying. Um, Perfect. Basically, you have you can have slurries, and depending on their, their dry matter, they can just be have a different nutrient content. Um, yeah. So yeah. Just, so none of those pie charts there are the same. They're all different. That's the take home message that there's no one size fits all, and slurry Perfect. will be different from shed to shed and from yeah, absolutely, system to system. Right. Okay, so moving on to, um, yeah, just this is just a final piece to the jigsaw, I guess, Sandra. It's that you need to have a balanced nutrient supply, okay? So your first, yep. and what I mean by that, I'm talking about a balanced fertilizer. So the nutrients need to be applied in the correct balance. So oversupplying of one nutrient is not going to make up our, our, our camouflage undersupplying of another nutrient, okay? Okay. So the fertilizer need the fertilizer you choose needs to complement the N, P, and K that's been previously applied in the year. Okay. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, that could be in the form of slurry or in the form of farmyard manure. Okay. So you need yeah. to push your nutrient program for the slurry and the farmyard manure, and also for the P coming onto the farm in the form of feed. That's usually five kgs per ton is the usual value and a lot of farmers out there now that we'd be speaking to a lot of, um, would say that they're allowed in their, in, in their uh, allowance to nitrates directive they're allowed to put out very little if any p so that's correct yeah the slurry that they have in the farm manure is essentially the only form of p they have so it's particularly important that they put it out as you say on the right fields so there needs to be a, a coordinated approach uh, from their soil, their soil test point of view and their nutrient plan. So as you said, the fields that are low in P, low in K, that they're where you target with your slurry, with your farm and manure, even if they're not convenient, if they're 10 minutes away, if they're 15 minutes away, go to them. Do not, I know my uncle at home, he has a chart in the, in the milking parlor and he's all the fields on it. Uh, with their pH status and their P's and K's and regardless of where those fields are, as I say, if they're 15 minutes away, if they're two minutes away, he, he looks at that on the day he agitates his slurry or the day he's going to spread his stone and that's where he goes with his P and K. There's no use yeah. in the field right beside the parlor just because it's convenient and it saves time because that... that yeah. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's one thing we're seeing the difference. In the olden days, if you gave me a set of soil samples, I'd instantly be able to tell you, number one, where the slurry was spread. And yeah. that was the field closest to the parlor. And yeah. I'd also tell you the silage ground because it would be on the floor index one for PK. Thankfully, because we've got more informed on this, uh, farmers are like your uncle, putting the slurry where it's most valuable to his system. And soil samples now are coming back. I can't tell which is the silage, you know, which which is great because it means that every field is becoming more balanced, you know, which is, which is really important. Well, I think in recent years, I agree. I think in recent years, there's really been a big push on slurry and, and, and realizing the potential of slurry and your, and your farm and manure. Because yeah. as, in a lot of scenarios, these are the only organic pea, pea allowed that farmers can spread. So farmers are using, we spoke about them already, the, the low emission slurry spreading techniques they're going out with a lot of slurry now in the spring as opposed to the summer because there's less volatilization of the nitrogen. There's just a more coordinated approach and people are, I suppose, realizing that 
not I'm probably getting a little bit sidetracked, but in a previous life, I used to work in the pig industry. And um, I remember when I was in that, essentially slurry was seen as a waste. It was seen as a byproduct. Yeah. And they were looking for a land bank of farmers that would take this slurry. Well, like that's 10 years ago. And now I think farmers are realizing the potential of slurry. It's something that's a, it's an asset and it needs to be, yep. it needs to be realized. Yeah, if, if, if there was a monetary value on their tanks, they wouldn't sell it. Exactly, yeah, exactly. Um, just the last two points, uh, you need to ensure the correct P to K ratio. So um, yeah, typically in a grazing scenario, um, this will be one is to two or one is to four in terms of the P K ratio. Um, we mentioned it already in a silage scenario, it might be at one is to six, okay? Yeah. And just the last point, don't forget the other nutrients. For example, sulfur, magnesium, we covered it already, your trace elements, your copper, your cobalt. And yeah, 30% of, of, of soils in Ireland, Sandra, are deficient in sulfur. And unfortunately, there's no test for it. Um, no, but if you spread sulfur, um, if you think you've that deficiency and you spread sulfur, you see an instant uh, change. I remember one year a farmer kind of said, oh, I'm spreading what you said, but I'm not getting any change, you know, reaction. And he changed and uh, the type of fertilizer and he bought um, it with sulfur. Yeah. Dramatically changed the farm and he wouldn't be without it now. Like uh, same with all fertilizers, little and often kind of from the April to July window, you know, yeah. and dramatic change on the farm. Yeah, particularly on sandy soils, I reckon. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's a, a, a recommendation of, I think it's 20 kgs per cut in a silage situation. or 20, That's right. 20 kgs over the year in a grazing situation. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah, again, this is just a, a picture which sort of illustrates what we just spoke about. Um, I just thought this was a very good, uh, a very good uh, graph to put up. It just it, it shows you we have a barrel of here right okay so um we're going to say we have a barrel of water here and we can see that phosphorus is the most limiting nutrient and yeah basically it just ties in what i was saying earlier that oversupplying of one nutrient is not going to make up for undersupplying of another nutrient so if for example we had to fix, fix this leaky barrel and we had to put on a lat onto the phosphorus well that will correct the phosphorus but you're still not going to be able to fill the barrel up with water because now the nitrogen is, is low now that yeah so it's just it's a coordinated approach what you call Sandra you need yeah. to you need to, have you need a, to fix the barrel the yeah. whole barrel and all aspects of it you can't just that's why as I say you need a balanced fertilizer or um, you can't just fix one and yeah that's it not the other yes okay okay um, perfect you need to supply direct uh, supply the correct PK balance uh, use your soil test results to, to to uh, decide what your maintenance or your build-up level is. Um, yeah, P and K already supplied, slurry, farmer, newer. Yeah, so I think we have a lot of that. If we're it's a good time, summary sheet, yeah. Okay. Well, if we're pushed for time, I'll move on. Okay, um, we've, we've alluded to this already in terms of uh, the timing of the P and K, as you said, Sandra, P and yeah. K can be applied all year round. P and K or N and P uh, are not permitted after the 15th of September. Uh, just be careful, as I said, uh, with PT and sandy soils. PT soils don't retain nutrients that great. No. Sandy no. Soils, so just uh, if, avoid putting out um, in the autumn. Large amounts, yeah. yeah. Little and often approach, um, yeah, exactly, is, is just the best thing to do. Okay, so the good news is now we're coming down to home straight. I'm on to the summary. <laughs> um, okay, so soil testing, it's a starting point to managing soil fertility. Um, uh, the best example I could give is if you were going for an operation tomorrow morning, you'd want the doctor to have an, uh, take an x-ray first. So soil sample, very same thing. Um, yeah. Soil pH, most important. All other nutrients are depending on it. Um, as I say, so lime, your forgotten fertilizer. Um, a target pH of 6.3 for grassland, 6.2 uh, in a hydronomium area, and 6.5 for cereals. Perfect, yeah. Soil fertility needs to be mongo monitored on an ongoing basis. The goalposts are always moving. Um, as you say, every two years is ideal. Uh, and yes, aim to, exactly. Yeah. Aim to achieve and not only not only achieve, but to maintain your soils at index three for P and K. And the last take home message, what you call it for today, is get your slurry analyzed. It's an asset. People need to realize that. As you say, if you could put it, yeah. yeah, if you could realize that a thousand gallons was equal to for example, 25 euro in terms of the MP and content, MPK content, 
and suddenly they were going out with 3,000 gallons and this was 75 euro, well, they'd, been, they'd be a lot more careful where they'd be spreading it. Exactly. Put it where it's needed. Yeah. Um, yeah, and this is just another slide, Sandra. I'm going to leave you um, talk about today. Yeah, um, one of the one of the main reasons uh, soil fertility is to the fore of both myself and Dermot's jobs, a hundred percent of the time. But just this, there's possible changes, and um, we haven't got them in black and white. They're not into law yet, but um, you know, people in derogation, there's going to be changes. And uh, the slurry um, from 2021 must be spread by less. And what I mean by that is the the trail and shoe and uh, the dribble bar and research and farmer practice over the last number of years has shown that that has become a very valuable resource. They're getting, um, we're losing less of our ammonia and our methane gases, and we're getting more of the nutrients down to the soil without contaminating our grass. So for derogation farmers, that's compulsory for the 100% of their slurry has to be spread by less next year. Um, they're going to be using a maximum of 50% uh, crude protein in their concentrate feed between April and September and farmers must attend uh, training programs in adopting best practice for nutrient use, which we've talked about this evening, man management, and more importantly, for the protection of our water courses. So just to let um, farmers know and our clients know, we will be running um, those derogation courses. We'll be advertising them in the press and all derogation farmers um, that we're looking after will be um, written to and informed of these courses. Um, like what we're doing here now, Dermot, we cannot uh, meet in a big hotel room or in the Chagas office of the Germinal uh, yeah. office of COVID. So we will be having those training by Zoom. So um, farmers will get to see their, their picture up on the screen with me and some of my colleagues over the next number of weeks to deliver those courses. So um, I'd encourage all farmers, we do have until 2021 to do it, but we won't be able to do all of it in 2021. So we're trying to get um, some of that work done this year. Um, and one important point, just in linking up all of that, uh, the, the talk is that um, the organic nitrogen level of a dairy cow is at 80, 85 kgs of organic nitrogen at the moment. And that is anticipated to move to 89. Um, and just to give you an example of somebody that has um, 100 dairy cows um, with no other stock on 51 hectares, I think, he'd have to drop five cows to bring him back down underneath the, the 170 limit. So um, they might be moving into the derogation um, plan system come the new year, and it would be really, really advisable to take on Dermot's advice and our advice this evening to get soil samples done because you need them for um, a derogation plan. But as we said, Irregardless of whether you farm one cow, two cows, 100 cows, or 100 bullocks, or 50 bullocks, you really should have a nutrient management plan for your farm. So that would be, you know, if you're in doubt on anything that I've mentioned, that you can contact us, um, any of us at our local offices in Thurles, Nina, or Clanmel, um, or any of your, your local Chagas offices around the country and chat to your advisor about what impact these changes are going to make to your farm. So if you want to move just on to the last one there, Derek, I'll just check for any final questions. Um, I think there's one more. Um, Sandra, when you're checking for your questions, um, yeah. we're doing another webinar, uh, our next webinar. It's on grazing brassicas. So our kales, our rapes, our swedes, our turnips. And uh, yeah, Perfect. our target date for that is the 12th of November, again, at 7.30. So please put it into your diaries if you have, um, if you have any of those brassica crops in the ground or have them sown and you want a bit of advice or guidelines in terms of raising them, you say, that's, that's, that's our next one, that's our upcoming one. And just to repeat what you said Perfect. earlier, I think there will be a, an email going out next Monday evening, which will be a recording of tonight's webinar. So for anyone that missed it or wants to go back on any of the points that were brought up, yeah, as I say, it'll be going out uh, next Monday. Okay, and the last question we have there is a farmer thinking of putting in red clover into a grass silage mix, what advice uh, for pH, P and K um, would you give him, Dermot? And he has lots of slurry. Okay, he's lots of slurry. Well, it's, uh, from a reg, to say the ideal pH for red clover is actually 6.5 to 7. So it's uh, again, so make sure. If so it's have, higher. Yeah, exactly. So if he doesn't have a soil test, soil test, uh, find out where he Perfect. is. 
And yeah, if he can bring it up to at least 6.5, ideally, as I say, 7 for, for red clover. And yeah, if he has loads of slurry, that's perfect because red clover essentially needs very little artificial nitrogen. And um, that's the idea of it. Clover has the ability to, to fix 150 kgs of nitrogen per hectare per year. So essentially, it's just peas and k's, peas and k's, peas and k's. Perfect. Some guys might go with a little bag, a, a little bit of nitrogen at the beginning of the year, for example, half a bag of urea just in February or something, just to get the grass kick started. Because the okay. red clover or with any clover is, it doesn't tend to get going until April, May, until soil temperatures, um, yeah, are up around the eight to nine to ten degrees. So the, you may go with half a bag of urea at the beginning of the year just to kick start the grass. And after that, it's essentially slurry, slurry, slurry. Yeah, that's the idea of clover. That it, it'll fix that nitrogen. So as I say, okay. it's, it's, it's organic, uh, organic manure. Okay, and just we'll take one. This is our last question. We've run people the fair fair juice to our listening audience uh, tonight. They've stayed on an extra half hour to to listen to us. So I hope they enjoyed it. But the, the last question. What are your thoughts, Dermot, on soil conditioners, particularly seaweed-based versus lime? Seaweed-based versus lime? Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, I, can't, I haven't come across too much of the seaweed now. I have to be honest, Sandra, I haven't either. So uh, yeah. uh, um, if it's possible, we might even come back to that and we might take note of that and then maybe look into it a little bit more. Perfect. Rather than giving bad advice, or <laughs> I'd rather give no advice. With you, um, it's not... <laughs> Oh, yeah, I know a huge amount about so um yeah I'm a little bit out of my comfort zone now on that one you know but anything uh, perfect that's grand anything that's designed to condition the soil and improve the soil fertility improve the soil organic matter but I say it should be looked at do you know what I mean um anything yeah. that will improve our, uh, our soil fertility our soil health not to be not to be um not to be ignored perfect Dermot thanks to our audience tonight um I hope that's out of it um, and as I say both of us can be contacted at our, at our relevant offices yourselves in the jockey and myself in the in the Thurlis office um, and just because of COVID restrictions we're still working away no restrictions so they can contact us at our, our numbers and I hope to see you all at the next webinar on the 12th of November so <laughs> night to Dermot yeah. from Sandra thank you very much thanks Amelia great talk to you again bye, bye, -bye.